Um, this is just a short, uh, um, I guess, uh, overview of uh, some, some of the work that we do and what might be relevant to um, the charter surveying community. And we've just got a few chats lined up, it's informal, and uh, we'll go through. Thanks to Anne and Sharon and the rest of the team here for putting this together. The, the reason that we got a bit of a slowdown is I think the first time that we've actually done this in about two years. So don't worry, it's not that we're incompetent here. We're actually quite good. You know, it, it's just that things are like rusty. Um, and and uh, we'll, 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 we'll keep on going and say anyway. Just before I kind of jump in, James, do you want to say something here just in terms of, you know, the background, just a few words as to that? Yeah, thanks, Jim. And um, morning, everyone. Just for those who, who don't know me, I'm James Margaret, I'm the Director of Education with uh, the FCSI. Um, firstly, thanks for coming on a wet morning. Um, and thanks very much to Tim and the team here for, for setting up this event. It's a couple of years since I've been here, and great to actually be back and see people in, in real life. Um, this, this event today is, uh, is part of our UAV Working Group CPD series. Tim is the current chair of our UAV Working Group. Um, which is an offshoot of our genomatics professional group. So if there's anyone here today, you know, members or non-members who's interested in getting involved in the UAV working group, um, get in touch with Tim or get in touch with me. We, we'd love to have you in the group. So we, we work on things like CPD, guidance, and um, on events, just to, to add to the body of knowledge for surveyors. So it'd be great to have a few people involved if you are interested. Um, and uh, yeah. My own email address, easy to remember, james at scsi.ie, if you'd like to get in touch uh, on getting involved or, or membership or anything like that, so please get in touch. Um, so thanks again, Tim, for organising today and to, to the team here. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Go on, James. Okay, look, guys, we'll, we'll jump straight in. I guess the, the, the main kind of message here, and we'll have different uh, people kind of um, uh, going through this, is uh, uh, things are changing, um, I guess, as we expect. But certainly in the geospatial side, and what we're, see we're seeing is this kind of shift to, you know, the expectation of high quality data in um, a much shorter um, turnaround time. And not only that kind of high quality data, but it has to be kind of adapted uh, to the particular kind of end use application. So it's uh, as opposed to just a generic map, it's now going to become kind of a geospatial service that somebody can use within their business for that particular kind of nuanced um, 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 activity that they're involved in. And uh, again, I, we're, we're just slicing through some of the things that we do here, Manuth. Again, I'm not going to um, dwell on it too much because Fergus and, and, and the rest of the crew are, are going to be uh, and say, Corey, but suffice to say, we do full stack, so like satellite, um, high altitude aerial, and uh, well, high altitude, like this aerial, 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet, and then drones then down at a couple of hundred feet. Equally, uh, we don't leave out the in situ piece here, which are these guys that like we've got box towers and soil moisture sensors. So that when we look at the kind of, you know, the ecosystem of Earth observation, that it's not just the remote sensing um, uh, say elements, uh, you know, uh, sensing remotely, but also those kind of uh, in situ uh, sensors as well. Quite, quite important from a cal calibration val validation point of view and, you know, expanding, extending uh, into different say, say areas. And uh, again, just some of the sensors that we have here, and again, afterwards, like, please come up and uh, have a chat with us uh, about these, like the standard photogrammetry, of course, and equally the, the LiDAR. We have the Vox 1 LR that's on the aircraft, the Regal, but we, uh, equally here we've, we've got the yellow scan, and, and I think the L1, I think uh, Fergal has the L1 uh, from D, DGI, and you know, on the optical side, we have multispectral, hyperspectral, um, and uh, I think uh, Sean will be chatting a bit about the, the spectrum here uh, in, in terms of, of, of its uh, capabilities. And uh, I, ge I guess it's worth saying that, that, that the change here is, that, that you can see is that, you know, if you go back 10 years um, and, you know, you look at LiDAR systems, like that was certainly the preserve of the kind of specialist, and you're looking at kind of hundreds of thousands of euros, if not kind of a half a million, uh, like a million not too long ago. And you look at the L1, and not only is that down at a price point, like, like 15,000 or thereabouts, uh, but equally the, the data um, processing workflows that come with that are now totally within, uh, you know, your, your uh, actual um, grasp uh, uh, without the need for any kind of specialist kind of knowledge. So things are kind of like changing in, in, in terms of um, the sensors and price and also the, the complexity. 
And here's one that, that I guess we were like, um, again, working with a, an external crew on just on the area of photogrammetry side. <clears throat> and you'll see here that the, they're, they're coming in with like, um, you know, off the shelf cameras and then bringing in some, you know, PPK uh, and then a bit of um, uh, some of the uh, Pixhog stuff then for getting the lever arms. And again, there's kind of a, a bit of a change. This is like affordable. What price was that? It was about 10,000 or 15,000? Sorry, people can't yeah, about 12, 12 yeah, yeah. So, so like, yeah, um, and, and, and like, you know, the sort of performance then in terms of like that centimetric or certainly decimeter um, uh, level in terms of uh, uh, both pixel resolution and also uh, potential for um, absolute position uh, is is there. Again, you know, bringing in, making the, the, or the health uh, warning uh, GCPs to check all of that. And I guess here in Luke, then of course we kind of branch into other kind of series, and we've got one of them there that looks like a, a pizza de delivery drone, but that's in fact a, a GPO, or this guy here. And the difference is, like of course, you know, we're all familiar with Baldrick and Time Team and so on. And these guys uh, go onto drones because if you've got ground that's kind of um, you know hazardous or it's you know pretty uh, rough to uh, get in, walk, see over, and drag your uh, trolley. Uh, probably we knew there with the drone with a rat out just keep say one or two meters above the actual ground and then you know in theory at least cover off at about um, is it a hectare in about 20 minutes or yeah. something like that now we're still uh, in the middle of testing this guy we've got two uh, versions 500 megahertz and 150 megahertz so we can go down looking at bog death like and you know the old kind of um, approach that we're using steel rods to do that manual and a bit risky uh, you could argue um, and uh, with this it's a lot more efficient and uh, it'll get you the information that you need uh, the sniffer then this is like socks nox co2 ch4 pm uh, 12.5 and uh, so on and again the, uh, we don't have it here um, uh, this is actually also lighting fires just to check the accuracy not the accuracy just to check to see if it works uh, first um, and uh, there's issues there, of course, with downdraft. Although if you're moving in a body of air, it doesn't really matter. It's going to measure down. I know you might say, well, why the hell are we looking at this stuff? Again, another kind of facet of this whole kind of like surveying kind of um, uh, industry is that things are changing. The expectations are that we kind of not just look at those kind of conventional kind of uh, image mapping and LIDAR, but that we extend into other thematic uh, series. So we, we, we just got to be aware of what's out there and what can be done. And we're uh, trying to get this guy uh, up and running as well. Uh, and you might say, what's he used for? Again, it, it's, it's air quality. It's quite topical at the minute um, with um, um, uh, peatland and, 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 and turf and so on. And uh, looking at in urban series, but equally we're looking at kind of methane over uh, agriculture series. We've got one project here, Terrain AI, where we are looking at um, you know methane emissions from agricultural activity. That can be both from our um, uh, belching cattle or cows, as well as the vegetation kind of rotting. And, and, and there's different kind of, you know, nuanced bits, like when you go in re wet ground and what happens there, there's uh, a bit of CH4 kind of uh, given off. The thermal thing you'd be aware of again, and uh, here, I, I guess, we're, we're, we pulled one of the sensors down there. I think it's from Fergus's uh, <laughs> stable and, and um, what we're doing here is taking something that, that has actually been designed really for kind of, you know, just kind of quick looks and see, or look and see, and we're trying to turn this into kind of um, a mapping um, um, uh, product, or not product, but a mapping uh, capability so that it flies over the ground. And then what we're going to try and do is like uh, push those through uh, an ortho correction uh, process to kind of make that image map. And uh, this one here, again, you can see. Well, if you were to believe it, I don't believe the, the like that's almost kind of like military grade. I think what they're doing is they're pushing the um, some of the, uh, the visible bands in there just to increase the spatial resolution, but the spectral re resolution typically for these civilian cameras uh, in a lot of cases are 640 by 512. Um, the military, of course, have slightly better. Again, we're looking into new kind of series, and this is um, a kind of drone that we've got coming in the next uh, three or four weeks, totally automated. Uh, the box opens up by P66, up it goes, and it takes a look around. And people shouldn't underestimate the ability to be able at 45 meters up. You, you can see forever, in inverted commas, you can see the important bits, that, you know, within that kind of couple of kilometers. And our interest here is like getting at the geospatial information. So what we're working on 
uh, Dara and, and so on, we're looking at intercepting the video feed and actually encoding the um, navigation in there. It's a bit like MISB, KLB stuff. It's like the, the in-frame uh, position. But to do that in real time and, and get back to the, the office, you might say, why, who on earth is interested in this? Well, like, you know, we've got a project going on with um, uh, the, the Air Corps at the minute and the fire service on um, wildfires. And one of the, the, the issues they have is that when they go out, um, they don't like free-flying drones, but they'll actually tolerate tether drones. And uh, also they want more importantly, kind of information um, that is readily available and that is useful to them to make their decisions as to how they kind of like tackle that, that fire. So like, I guess what we're seeing is that kind of shift from the, the you know, the kind of the older kind of um, uh, enterprise grade systems to this kind of like data function service. And it, it's almost becoming kind of like a web uh, service. So I think the geospatial community have to watch for that in, in years to come. But what might happen is that we've got these little kind of Lego brick components and, and that uh, folk will specialize in, in developing these kind of web services and that these can be integrated then for um, by different people to do different things rather than give you like a complete enterprise uh, solution uh, where, where they don't use you know three quarters of, of the functions or the capabilities. Again, comms, and, and this is just uh, like what we're trying to do is, is kind of open it up here. Uh, this is like the squawk box, and again, Dara here is uh, with John Dooley taking the lead. And really, what it is, it's like it's, it's five or six kind of like SIM cards. It's uh, we're working with um, colleagues in the states on on this. It's kind of air to ground comms. And you might say, why the hell that should be megabit, by the way? And you can stream, you know, good Netflix at about six uh, yeah. megabits. So this uh, problem is that when you're up in the air, the three um, G LTE, four G is, is is designed for ground based terrestrial activity, not really for for aerial. So what this guy does is he handles all the handshakes, so that when you're moving around from your um, uh, um, so mobile is actually um, uh, making contact with a new uh, mast, so it drops, and then you get this kind of break, you know, the usual stuff, the data. This guy is actually correcting that, and he has uh, multiple links and multiple handshakes, so he maintains that stream. This has been tested over uh, days at different uh, heights, flying altitudes, and we're in the middle of getting this kind of working for some of the bits. You can see how this this is with the um, uh, some of the thermal uh, imaging capability that we had, and it was like, you know, for some, you know, a wildfire uh, scenario or flooding uh, scenario, getting that kind of geospatial information back to the decision makers in the right format, the right time, that's, that's the sort of thing. So again, on the, I guess, from the, 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 uh, the surveying point of view, it's like looking at that kind of temple um, piece being squeezed, but the expectation is to get that information to generate it and get it back to those who want it a lot sooner. Not all the time, but um, some of the time. Again, not forgetting our good old friends there, the satellite um, um, space remote sensing and, and you know what, what we can get from that, like looking at big areas like down in Killarney and the damage there. I, I'll finish off because I'm going uh, too slow here. Like this is our, like we are interested of course in the platforms and the sensors and so on, but like really our strength here in the new is the geocomputational and computational side, like extracting useful information from those data streams. And like we have kind of, you know, um, uh, had a step change over, over the last kind of year, two or three, and just moving into these strategic and tactical web services and um, where we put the data together, with function together with a service and build that uh, with the industry standard, making sure, you know, OGC, W3 and so, so on, and that they can then be kind of put together by building blocks to make uh, different things. I'll just quickly finish out here some of the bits here that we've been working on the common operation <clears throat> picture and like it's, it, it's like this whole thing here where we put this kind of, you know, more faster kind of data turnaround on the geospatial side and uh, like here we're, we're, we're doing bits with them um, on the climate change side on infrastructure and, uh, and so on. Look, I, I'd stop that at that and if it, it's okay Fergus, uh, I'll ask you to finish it up and uh, no, I don't, know, I don't know if I need to have no, I need to put my hand here. Okay, right, and look, if you can go, go on there, and I'll just
Yeah, that's okay. Is that okay? Yeah. There we go. Okay, thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. My name's uh, Fergus Foyle, and I run uh, a company called GeoAirspace. We're a geospatial technology company focusing on aircraft and drone data collection. We, um, we work with the university really closely here. We carry out all the kind of data collection, I guess, for the university. So all the sensors you see, a lot of these are owned by the university and we would fly them on their behalf. So the more complex hyperspectral, multispectral LIDAR, we would equip our, our aircraft, you can see there, you can actually see the sensor body, um, which is there, I think it's down the back of the table as well, a, a prototype of it. And we switch between aircraft and drones. So we have um, the same sensors that would be put on the aircraft to want the drones as well. So the way we see it, the way we're kind of using it is to look towards the future where like, what we can do today can be done with a plane. So beyond visual line of sight operations will happen in time with drones. But at the moment, we're kind of putting the same sensors and collecting that same data on an aircraft to allow us to fly further uh, and for longer. But I guess today I just want to speak about different types of platforms, different types of drone sensors that we use, kind of regulation, what's involved in doing this work, because I know a lot of the surveyors in the world will, are obviously using drones at the moment, and, and there's a whole host of regulation that's constantly changing. Just in January of this year, the IEA, the Aviation Authority here in Ireland, have implemented new European-wide regulations, so um, it's about being able to operate safely uh, under the right guidance, because the, the regulations do change, and they will keep changing, as technology advances, it's almost technology is moving faster than a kind of regulation can keep up. So over the last couple of years, the IEA have had to kind of keep re, re kind of <coughs> rewriting the rules, I guess, for the way we operate as technology advances. So I'll speak a little about that, and then finally, just show you some of the kind of data outputs that we collect uh, and process after we capture this data. And um, again, Tim sort of alluded to some of this platform. You can see some here, but. The larger one there is with a 3.5 meter wingspan multi rotor. So it's actually similar to this, it's a larger version of that where it takes off vertically. So you can operate in tight spaces, take off vertically, and then transitions to forward flight. It carries different types of sensors. So they're all generally integrated where you'd have RGB to LIDAR to multispectral, hyperspectral. The platform is just a tool to carry that sensor. So you can see the different versions of the uh, drones there that. We use and we operate. So um, there's lidar scanners. Yeah, there's a whole host of sensors that we would typically operate and just switch them between drones and aircraft. And um, again, some of the more specialized ones. The one you can see on the on the ground there is the pizza box one. We're uh, doing some trials the last day. Tim mentioned that so sort of it flies at two meters above the ground, ground penetrating radar. So we're still testing. So we can't say for sure, but we believe we're told it kind of operates or um, penetrates down to seven, eight, nine meters. So we're doing some trials, you can see as we dug some holes and, and uh, just to test its capabilities. This was uh, a project, uh, not project, it was a landslide with a leak from last year. Um, I think it was G GSI uh, were coordinating the kind of data collection. So we were tasked to go up with the aircraft and drones, aircraft at a higher altitude to collect large, larger areas and drones and we went in kind of more locally and collected a whole host of LIDAR and, and kind of, kind of Calculate the volume of um, soil that was removed from the mountainside, sort of a seven kilometer landslide essentially from the top of the mountain right down to the, the lake below. LiDAR scanners, and I'll talk a bit about regulation uh, shortly, but you can see this is essentially what we would typically use on a, on a kind of a urban um, road survey or urban areas. When you're flying near or over people, you now have to have, you can see this is just an M300 drone, it's not there, but Two, um, two parachutes on board and two flight termination systems on either or a flight termination system connected to the two batteries. So in the case of uh, a motor failure, the parachutes get deployed automatically. So really when you're operating, it's fine to go out into green fields and operate um, away from people without parachutes and without flight termination systems. The minute you go into urban environments, I mean, not just, I mean, here in the car park, you couldn't, fly at the moment without sort of parachutes and flight termination systems. So it's really important that you understand the regulation if you are using drones, because at the moment, as I said, it's changing so quickly and it's about sort of staying on top of the regulations. And a few training tools in Ireland, obviously, that can, can support if you are integrating drones in your organization and you want to get up to speed and regulations. But I, I mean, feel free to ask questions after this and I can kind of help a bit more. But um, so yeah, the last few months has really changed and just, uh, 1st of May uh, last week is now 
it, there was an exemption that you didn't have to use a flight termination system, but it's now compulsory. So um, there's different categories of operations. We have open, specific, and certified, and that's European wide. Um, but as surveyors, as commercial operators, you would generally operate in a specific category. And if you're doing that, then you have to have parachutes and flight termination systems. Unless you're out in the middle of the green field and there's no one around, then you're okay. But uh, the other drones, yeah, that's just a large, larger version of that. And um, some tests we did here with Manute, carrying mobile phones, part of that project Tim mentioned. So I guess we, we just kind of put sensors on drones and or aircraft and fly them and collect data. So we're very efficient at sort of operating uh, drones and aircraft. That's a the sensor pod. Um, again, equipped with LiDAR, the line here in the middle, and there's an RGB camera, and that gets changed so we can put different sensors depending on the kind of application. Um, so it carries multiple sensors at the same time. Playing with some's got a paint job, but that's the same pod. And as I said, it's down the back if you want to have a look after. Um, not the plane, the pod. <laughs> um, some of the applications, so land surveying, obviously, which obviously is the various you would know a lot about. That type of work we're involved with, we would help or get support from uh, real surveyors. We just carry out the data collection component. Environmental monitoring, as Tim mentioned, some of the air quality assessments. And again, a lot of this is prototype and development. So, um, we're using these uh, specialized sensors. Asset management, that might be power lines, power line inspection, uh, wind turbine inspection. These are hard to reach places that traditionally would either involve a person on the ground with a um, binoculars trying to inspect the top of a turbine, someone climbing the turbine, obviously dangerous and risky. And um, drones now offer a really quick and efficient way of collecting this data. And they can do it repeatedly over the same uh, flight path. So you're collecting this sort of temporal uh, level of information over time, which is, I guess, really important. And it's automated, it's much more efficient than you would do it by hand. There's no two ways about it. Specifically for that sort of operation where, where it's high risk environments that really drones are a good solution. Subsurface mapping, as I mentioned, and um, aircraft and some of the emergency response. But there could be like 50 of these different types of applications that we use drones for, or that as surveyors you will in time use drones for. But um, that's just a kind of a typical. Uh, Example. So, as I said, there's some land surveying, assets management, asset inspection, linear infrastructure, infrastructure monitoring and mapping. So, that might be right away monitoring along a power line corridor or a road corridor. So, large scale mapping that you don't need to close the road. Traditionally, you may have to kind of have some traffic management system in place. With drones, you can now do the operate remotely, whereby roads and rail lines and these can remain open without having to be closed and still collect really efficient, uh, a really good high quality data efficiently and quickly, I guess, is the most important. That's important for the, the end user who, I guess, doesn't want to close down roads or, or railway lines and drones obviously provide high quality data that can do that. Um, so when it comes to operating drones, I guess there's four key, key things that you need to consider. Um, there's compliance, uh, compliance means of legal and regulatory compliance uh, from the Irish Aviation Authority from and now EASA, which is the European Wide Aviation uh, Safety Agency. And then there's the GDPR and data privacy. That's a really important piece that you need to consider if you're flying in urban environments. Uh, anywhere there's people, anywhere it's possible to collect personally identifiable information. So it's really important that not only are you looking at it from a regulatory point, or sorry, uh, airspace regulatory point of view, but also from a GDPR compliance point of view. So if you're collecting information, how has that been held? How has that been stored? How has it been processed? There are important questions that need to be addressed. And one way of doing it is the data privacy impact assessment. And um, there's obviously the safety, safety components of before you even go out to operate, ensuring risk assessments are done, flight planning is done. These are all done at home on the desk. And um, I jump forward or line with that. And um, the um, then the flight operations uh, in the field, how you operate, and that's part of your training, I suppose, at the outset. You, you're going to have a set of operational procedures in place that. Um, you need to comply with every time you go out on site, and then there's off-site reporting once you're back, ensuring the, um, the data has been collected efficiently or correctly. Sorry, I should say. Um, in terms of regulation, there's, as I mentioned to earlier, the regulation has changed last year, but it's really only been implemented this year. This is an airspace map, a drone airspace map of Ireland. Red areas are, are what's called um, restricted or controlled airspace, and uh, green, well, essentially restricted and controlled. So red, you'd have to get permission to fly within, uh, and you need your license or your Irish Aviation Authority permit. Yellow is restricted to a degree. Um, you can operate in there, but there's limitations. With the right licensing and with the right permissions, 
you can operate anywhere. I mean, in terms of um, getting the right permission, you can operate anywhere in the country, is what I'm trying to say. Um, just, as I said, there's three, nowadays there's three um, categories of operation for a drone operator in the country. You have open, specific, and certified. Open is very typical drones like this, the smaller Mavics, um, that type of drone. Well, you can operate up to 25 kilos, I should say, in the open category, but it's really a kind of a, a rules-based assessment. The IA, or the European Aviation Safety Agency, have kind of set out a set standard of rules that you must comply with to, in order to operate in the open category. It's low-risk operations, it's away from people, it's within line of sight, it's sort of maximum altitude, uh, and then there's different classes depending on the weight of drone. So that's that would be a sort of 250 kilo drone, <clears throat> or 250 gram um, drone, um, two kilos, so I one there, but then sub 25 are these bigger ones here, bottom of the table. But you can see you have to remain 50 meters away from people, uh, and then for the larger drones, 150 meters away from people. So really that's not really practical when you're operating commercially, because you generally operate in urban environments, as I said. So that's where you move into a specific category. It's higher risk, but with that comes the ability to operate um, in more complex environments, doing more complex operations. That might be beyond visual line of sight, dropping payloads, delivery, that type of thing. So really as a commercial operator, I would say you need to be in the specific, you don't have to be, but it would probably be best. You don't, you're not required to have insurance in the open category, whereas a lot of, uh, I guess, your clients would require insurance, so therefore you have to operate in the specific category. Um, and then there's two, two kind of sub-components within the specific category, predefined risk assessment or SORA. Predefined that these kind of rules that are set by the Aviation Authority and you must comply with them and you can't operate outside of that. That allows you to operate in urban environments but you must have controlled ground area. So for example, if you do the survey down the road, you have to kind of close that road or within 150 metres of that road, close it, um, so you can't just fly over it. However, if you operate in with a SORA, which is a specific operational risk assessment, then you can, you have parachutes, you have flight termination systems. So it allows you just a bit more flexibility. You know, there's a cost implication with sort of equipping your drones with this uh, equipment and it takes a lot of work to kind of get the SORA. But again, that's a whole training piece and a regulation piece that I guess if you're not familiar with it, you'd need to be familiar with it if you're operating drones. Certified category is really for kind of people carrying drones. We're not there yet. There is drone operators in Europe operating in the certified category, but it's, but it's not really um, relevant at the moment. It's either you'll operate in the open or, or um, specific categories. I won't go into too much detail on this. <clears throat> this is more um, what's involved in a typical drone service. You have desk-based, field-based, and then you're back at the desk analyzing data. So when you, before you go on site, you do your risk assessments, get your permissions, all the flight planning, airspace approval if you're in controlled airspace. Once you're on field, there's further risk assessments, there's on-site procedures which you have an operations manual, and you'll comply with that as you go through the steps. So it's not just a case of taking the drone equipment to the field and, and flying where you like. You really have to follow a predefined set of rules that you as the operator will have uh, written in the party operations manual. So if you're a large organization or a large survey company, you'll generally, all your operators will operate up to the same standards of when they go into the field. There's no confusion over who's doing what or what needs to be done. It's a set kind of checklist you follow. Um, and then you can collect your data, obviously. And once that's collected, so the whole host of data processing analysis and ultimately data quality is really important. So ensuring that it's not just um, that you have uh, QC the data at the end. Um, risk assessments and method statements are really important. I won't go into detail, uh, but it just means that before you on site that you've analyzed the risk, the level of risk, uh, and you're operating the right piece of equipment. Uh, under the right kind of authorization from the Aviation Authority. That's really important. Um, certain jobs just can't be done because they're too risky. Um, but, but there is always kind of mitigation you can put in place, and one of those obviously is really a parachute. Flight planning, um, again, before you go on site, you plan your mission. On a, well, when it comes to uh, drones, they're mostly autom uh, automated, I shouldn't say autonomous, <coughs> automated so that. Prior to going on site, you've, this is an example of a power line survey we did. Um, we've set the flight line spacing, the altitude of the drone, everything is pre-planned. So once we get on site, we check that those parameters that we've set, uh, we know exactly where we're going to fly, we check, we assess the risk, um, we've notified everyone in the area and so forth. But once the drone takes off, it, it, it's automated to a degree. The pilot or the operator will be there with the control to take back uh, the controls that need to be, but generally the data is collected uh, automatically. Again, once on site, as I said, sort of brief third parties, check local weather, confirm your airspace approval. There's a whole host of like, there's probably 50 kind of items you need to go through on site, but 
you do need to have a, a predefined kind of set of rules that you will follow once on site. And um, this may play this yeah. That's just an example mm -hmm. of uh, an automated flight again of that same site that I showed you. That's the, the flight path of the drone for you. It should speed up in a second. The drone just uh, takes off automatically and follows these. The lidar serving up a power line and um, follows these flight lines, comes back and lands, um, and you have real time data as that's being collected and then that's post processed. Um, and it's, it's just a very, very efficient way. As a human, you just couldn't fly that in that form. Yeah. So to have a, an automated system on board or a flight planning app that allows you to do that is really important. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, it's accurate. It's, there's a constant speed. There's no human error. Um, you've been able to do it remotely. So a power line, obviously, is a high-risk environment. So <clears throat> operating drones in that environment obviously has its own risk. But they're inherent to all drone operations. But it allows an operator or a client, I guess, um, collect really efficient data quickly over a kind of a high-risk environment without putting people at risk. Uh, some of the outputs, typical outputs, these would be very standard. And uh, there's a lot more complex depending on the type of sensors you're using. But high-resolution inspection images, as you can see there, uh, uh, aerial um, portal mosaic, sorry, um, point clouds, 3D models, digital surface models, di digital terrain models. Uh, obviously, this can be done with different types of terrestrial sensors, but I guess the advantage drones has is scale and speed, so you, you can cover large areas really quickly. Um, an example of a, a that's a lidar survey for um, hydrology assessment. The advantage of lidar obviously it penetrates vegetation, so you can that's a surface model, so it has all the building trees. With the lidar, you can just strip back all the vegetation and buildings, and uh, you're left with bare ground. Uh, you can see it on the right, the same two pictures, just to point out the uh, surface model and the elevation model all the trees removed so you can kind of see river channels and any kind of uh, terrain features that are of importance for flood mapping and analysis. Yeah, that's just again one, one application. I guess I think that's, that's about right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, like, it's just the same, that the big takeaway here is that with surveying, like compared to a lot of other uh, drone kind of activities, um, what's changed in the last year is that these new regulations mean well affect right across the board yeah. typical survey surveying activities where where you go whether it's photogrammetry or whether it's multi spectral or lidar or whatever yeah. and what's what's not the folk that may not necessarily be affected by the folk that say do kind of like wedding singer yeah kind of stuff. Right. so that's 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 the big difference and and it's true to say that even now and people here will, will know this in, uh, across the country here. There will be people operating kind of mapping activities, and they're not fully aware of some of the regs here in terms of P PTS yeah. or sorry, the, the FTS and the need, need for shoots. Most, That's what's uh, yeah. Most changed. survey companies I would speak to generally operate drones themselves out of the in house, but they have no idea that the regulations have changed so quickly. And now most are not compliant, I would say, early part of this year. Some are getting up to speed now, but. It's really important that you do understand uh, what actually is possible when a client asks you to go and collect data. It's not just a case of going out and flying. You have to really um, ensure that you're actually none of these drones here have uh, parachutes or flight termination systems that could show you. But um, anywhere within close proximity to people, it's really important that you have those kind of uh, safety mechanisms built in or on board at least. So, and the last thing to say, like, there's been the stutter going on here, really, with the uh, drone kind of industry and that. But the rates have come in, but for instance, for us to retrofit some of the um, FPS and the shoots on, on these, they're not necessarily available or even certified. So, you could be sitting there with like kind of, you know, a hundred grand worth of kit. And it's virtually kind of useless because it's not really certified to, uh, to operate potentially. Okay, uh, I'm Barry Walsh. I'm just going to go through some of your sensors. So, we all know where to be. So, red, green, blue camera, that's your standard camera. When you're carrying a drone surface, you can get much more information. So, the first sensor I'm going to show you here is called the Microsense Album. So, this is a multi spec camera. So, we've got uh, red, green, blue, near red, and red edge, as well as the thermal. And with this camera, we can learn a lot about uh, vegetation health in an area. So with this as well, we also have a light meter. So when we take an image with this camera, the camera's pointing down and the light sensor's on top of the drone. So what we actually give back is we get the, the percentage of light incident on the ground reflected back in that wavelength. This can tell us a lot of information about vegetation on the ground. 
So if we look here, we can see how the different wavelengths of this sensor can pick up information about stressed and non-stressed plant uh, life. So there's the next step up from this is the hyperspec. So the spectrum here, this is a hyperspec camera. So the camera I just showed you there was five band. This is 224 band. Now these cameras are painful enough to work with, and it's purely because the amount of information you're going to collect. I think we did a flight last year, and within one minute we made collected 12 gigs of data, and that wasn't even uh, recorded at full resolution. So with this type of camera, you can uh, pick up a lot of information. So and what's also different about this, these types of camera, they are push broom. So when you're using a push broom camera, it actually scans left to right as you move along the flight path. So with this, it's not like a normal snapshot camera. You have to take into consideration a lot more uh, things while you're doing it. So just to let you know, that's just again, it's uh, 400 nanometers to 1,000, to up to 224, and uh, resolution is uh, 1024 across track. But because it is a push room uh, camera, because as the, um, it's not like a traditional uh, photogrammetry process where you get high point matches of the images. And um, we actually need a high quality IMU. So we need to know everything about the uh, roll picking yaw of the sensor as it moves along to get a good stitch on the camera. And finally, yeah, just to give you an information. So this is uh, at what height, what frame sampling distance we're looking at. So we do spatial binning. So that's where we um, put two um, pixels together. You can also do just to get better, but um, just to give you a bit of information. And Sean? Yeah. It's actually going to stand here. That's what it looks like there. Uh, if you saw it, uh, it's about 100 grand by the time you, 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 you add all, you, you know, so like the add, the add ons, it doesn't seem, seem to be a lot for 100 grand, but they are typically quite expensive. And as Dara said, like a key point you'll be aware is that you get this kind of um, a slit of imagery. And as you're moving down the line, they, that, that has to be directly georeferenced -refer because we can't tie point it. So we use uh, the, the, um, the GPS assignment as to do that. Yeah, so my name is Sean O'Kane. I'm a PhD student under Tim. And I'm just going to talk briefly about kind of our, our use case of the FX10 that we uh, had last year. Um, so we flew it on the uh, Cessna F172 um, in August last year. We did two flights. Um, over Dublin Bay. So my PhD is about water quality and mapping water quality basically in Dublin Bay. Um, so obviously with a hyperspectral camera, it's basically the same as a multispectral camera with many more bands, um, which is ideal for this kind of application. And um, so obviously that's the, the sensor pod, which contains the camera. There's another kind of image of it here. This is our boat, which is in the water at the same time sampling. So we have coincident in situ data for validation. This is the camera within the sensor pod without the cover. Uh, this is our flight GPS track uh, from the day. Um, yeah, so this is just the, the problem here is that what, an image um, of water isn't very exciting. So I, I just told our uh, foresight calibration image just to give you an idea of, um, of the kind of data that it collects. And um, now, as Sarah said, this is a push room sensor, so you can see, you know, the um, the, the, the kind of image is kind of wavy, but uh, that doesn't really matter because once you do your foresight calibration, um, which is a calibration between the hyperspectral spectral imaging sensor and the IMU within the uh, sensor, and um, then the image can be matched up extremely accurately to the ground. And um, yeah, so this is just our foresight calibration flight. Um, yeah, so this is just, yeah, this is our. Uh, Dublin Bay flight. So we did two flights, one on the 25th and one on the 18th. Uh, and this was in conjunction, as I said, with water quality sampling. Uh, so the main constituents I was looking at are chlorophyll and uh, total suspended solids. Um, and this was also coincident with uh, satellite overpasses as well. Um, yeah, so our, our flight altitude was uh, 12,000 feet uh, AGL. And we were uh, getting a 50 centimeter pixel size on the ground, which is incredible. And um, considering that we were doing spatial binning of the two, so uh, we could have got 25 centimeters, but the signal to noise uh, over water dictates that, you know, 50 centimeters is good enough, basically. It's probably too good, to be honest. Um, but that can be resampled. 
So this is our, our flight lines. So uh, we have site one A and then site one B. Um, and basically the intended plan was to have just one site. We do our kind of um, you know our flight lines in this orientation. And the problem is Dublin Airport's approach is here. So uh, as Fergus kind of mentioned, uh, this is a huge thing with operations is uh, being combined with um, kind of uh, airspace regulations. So we had to coordinate with Dublin Airport and they asked us just to fly um, in this pattern um, above the, the wall here, the sea wall. So that's the, uh, the only difference between those. Um, yeah, these are in situ samples that we took at the same time. Uh, so the boat was uh, buzzing around below us, uh, collecting these. And uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's not pretty much it. Yeah. And then again, the reason for the relevance for that, I guess, is about like moving to the image offshore. And, and as uh, surveyors, you gotta keep an eye on that, that okay, we possibly going to be up there with both stations, but there will be surveys required uh, close to the coastline, and uh, platform sensors like this could be uh, relevant. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, quickly talk you through um, after the data we collected, the network goes into processing. So, as Sean said, there are about four sites. So, uh, big thing for highly active data is knowing your bore site. So, this is the relative of the sensor to the ID and also your lever arm. So, you want to know the offset and XYZ of the um, TPS antenna to your sensor. So, as you see here, this is where the sensor pod is, and the uh, GPS antenna is actually sitting just about here. So, what you need to do is when we're going up to do before. We put a new sensor in, we'll get a total station out and get down the X, Y, and Z offset as accurate as possible to ensure we have the best available data. So when you collect LIDAR data to start off with, the first thing we need to do is we need to open up RAD and IDI care office and we need to do uh, GPS pulse processing so we get the closest uh, OSI base station data for the day and time. And after we post process the GPS with help of the base station data and the IMU, then we can generate the land style, so we'll bring it into MM capture. And then after that, to uh, do noise removal, flight line alignment, and lighter classification, we will use a combination of Bentley, TerraMatch, TerraScan. And after all of that done, then we'll go in and do visual inspections on the day to make sure everything is all okay. We'll do cross sections to make sure the um, overlap and flight lines and routes match up. And we'll just get make sure the day is good. And then with that done, what we need to do is now make the data accessible. So LiDAR data could be you know, a 10 gig file, not everyone's laptop can handle it. So what we can look at doing is actually uh, make the data accessible through the web. So here is a, what um, a LiDAR scan that was done last year we have. But what we can actually do is now make this data very accessible through the web and anyone can come in and view it and see the data in 3D through the web. And it's just a nice interface where you don't uh, not everyone's going to have a machine that has 64 gigs of RAM. 64 gigs of RAM is the RAM we need for all the PCs we process it, and usually you need 16 gigs of RAM just to view it comfortably. But with a system like this, you can bring it into the web viewer. It's, it most people have a decent enough internet connection. They can view it, they can look at it, they can come down and actually start to do things with it, play with it, and see what we can do here. So they can come in and they can start to look at different slides. Elevation profiles, they can do cross sections, they can turn on and off the different classifications. So, if you don't want to look at, so if you come in here and you don't want to look at height vegetation, you can just turn it off like that. And it becomes a very accessible way where you can just share a link and people can start to work with the data. Let me just go back to the presentation. So that was quite, and another thing is when you're doing quality control is um, GCP and LiDAR. So what you can use is a very highly reflective page, or you can use what we find a lot of the time is road markings. If you have a nice road marking, that's a very good GCP to use for validation. But with LiDAR, you never really know 100% what's going to come out well unless you're using a specific uh, mark like that. But um, with the road markings, what we always do is we always go out and take more GCPs and pop than we need because it's always going to be the case you think someone's going to look great and bright and very accurate in the lighter and you can't see it whatsoever. So that was the old Fox One system. New systems now are becoming much easier to process, a lot less work involved. 
So this is a uh, PO scan function surveyor. It's literally click one button, starts recording, hit the same button again, stops recording. To process the data, all you do is drop it in here after you do your DTS post processing. You choose your scan angles, you choose your flight lines, and you just press play, go. Everything's done itself. It is much nicer to work with and not as good as the focus one, but they're making these systems um, better and better every day and easier to process. And then again, this is another system. So if you're working in the GPS uh, denied environment where you can't have GPS, you can actually do slide, slam based slider surveys. And again, it's just a lovely drop it in, press play, all the data is processed, and the systems just are getting easier and easier to work with. And this will produce uh, a data like this. Now, this is not geo reference, but it is a metric, so it's back to about five centimeters. You can take measurements in it. So, this is an example of um, Val Donald's hangar for their helicopters. So, then the next other part is also doing the photogrammetry. So, with your photogrammetry, you go out, you connect all your RGB images. Now, if your drone is RGK, so real time kinetic GPS, that's great. You don't do any post -process processing on your drone. But depending on the environment you're working it working in, so you're working in a very hilly area, you may lose signal strength and your RTK may break down, and then you're back with bog standard GPS. In that case, nearly all the time, if your GPS sensor is capable of doing RTK, it's going to record in the RIX data. So then you'll have to go back and do um, post processing anyway. But you really need to get the post processing to get your uh, photogrammetry uh, or mosaics down to below five centimeters. So the steps to um, do photogrammetry is add all your photos, line your photos, optimize the cameras, build a dense cloud, build the um, build our mosaic, export for your results, and you're good to go. Um, which, and then you get a lovely high accuracy. Um, this is five centimeter. It doesn't look at here, but that is a five centimeter um, or mosaic, and that is the same area in Google Maps. Now, when you're doing your um, error checking with your or mosaics. When you put down your ground control points, again, put out more than you need, because what will happen is on this survey, what happened with one of the lads was a farmer came out and decided he wanted to put the grass in front of his house. So he flung one of the GCPs away. Someone else ran over a GCP, so we couldn't use that one. So always put out more than you need. And it's also good if you spray a bit of a mark so you know the way it was orientated, and you know it was, it was definitely there because if someone comes and interferes with the GCP, that's no longer any good to you. So it's just, uh, yeah, always more DCPs than you think you need because there is a good chance someone is going to interfere with at least one of them. And the funny thing I, we've had said to us a few times is, so this was two centimeter accurate? Yeah. Yeah, two, this is a two centimeter accurate um, orthomosaic from that's what we calculate from the GCP we took on the day. And um, people will say to you sometimes that it doesn't align with Google Maps. It's actually Google Maps doesn't align with the data we're producing because Google Maps isn't doing proper auto rectification. So you'll find a lot of the time Google Maps might be you know a meter or two out, and people just think Google Maps is possible where in reality it isn't. Um, and that's it for me. Fantastic. And it's worth saying that the GeoSlam that's useful in G a GPS benign environment. So you can go down a cave, go into a set of a building, you can go into a building. It's slam based, so what it's doing is it's all relative. But we build the uh, LiDAR model um, uh, by a SLAM. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get started here with that. Uh, and the, the second thing that's worth pointing out there too um, from Dara's stuff, the pole trees, that's all open source. Yeah. And just keep an eye on that because you open source it uh, years and years gone by, you know, it's a lot of poor quality um, and so on. However, it does have a role to play. And like something as simple as being, being able to share uh, LiDAR or photogrammetry. Is actually quite a powerful thing to do, and as Dara was saying there, you don't need a powerful machine because it's all handled uh, on <coughs> the uh, far end. This here now, we're just going to move, and again, apologies here because we're kind of going to fast forward into machine learning. And I know you might say, well, "Hang on, uh, you haven't made a connection between uh, all these things." But we just um, uh, jump in here just um, uh, to cover off on, 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 on a very elementary problem in the geospatial world: how to kind of figure out uh, the structure. Of um, uh, an image, and in this case, um, uh, an aerial uh, image. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I am Mr. Shum. Uh, I work as a machine learning engineer here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to demonstrate uh, the machine learning part in one of the use cases for field of like palm tree delineation. 
so the main part uh, or the main problem with palm order delineation is the age detection. So you might say why we do age detection with machine learning. Uh, so the point of it is uh, we want non-trivial edges compared to all the edges in the image. So uh, if you see there's a ladder here, we just want the periphery of it. And uh, that's what we want for machine learning. If you use normal computer vision techniques, it will give lots of lots of uh, gradients there. So uh, we use machine learning for that. It's uh, called the feature convolution feature, which is basically a, a, a convolutional neural network. And we use that to train that network using a BSDS dataset, which is a Berkeley dataset, uh, having 500 images of these non-trivial uh, boundaries. So it has outdoor as well as indoor scenes. So it will make the um, uh, the training so basically uh, independent of whether it's a uh, indoor scene or, or, or the outdoor scene. So, uh, so, by, so um, making this a connection with uh, palm or delineation, we use RCF model basically to extract the non trivial edges, and then we basically uh, build a hierarchy of the edges and then uh, figure it out. Uh, what ROI we want and what uh, level of detail we want in that particular case. So here is the output from RCF model. So you can see in the farm, uh, it detects the non-trivial edges and not all the gradients here. So you can see in this part, uh, it just detects the boundaries and not all the gradients inside this particular field. Um, it also is shown here uh, and you based on this output, we uh, create the hierarchy, so it's very hard to see here, I guess. Uh, so it's basically, if you see, there are bright points and these are like a light shade. So basically these are more weighted compared to these um, based on their volume and area. Once we have that, we can just threshold to uh, threshold this output uh, to basically get the level of detail we want. Uh, so if you uh, increase the threshold, the level of details get slower. And if you increase the uh, or lessen the threshold, the level of details goes up. Uh, so we can use this to extract uh, in a farm what are the boundaries of the fields, as well as use NDVI, which is the, um, another index uh, where you uh, figure it out if the uh, soil, if, if it is a green particular area or a road or a soil, maybe and use that to basically delineate where the roads are, where is the hedgerows and all the things. So this is the spatial uh, information taken into account. Uh, Garo is gonna tell you how we do this uh, with the temporal information as well. So. Perfect, Sheila. Sure. Key thing here, I guess, is that uh, as the rarest that we collect uh, data, but like the, the customer may not want an image now, they may say we want the line work. That's a completely different story. And line work can be uh, uh, quite intensive from a manual point of view. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is the use of AI uh, within kind of geospatial tasks to take the human out of the loop. Simple as that. But we're now going to just push in and just start colouring this story up a bit. So okay, we've got the structure of those fields. Now what's more important is to start working out the intelligence of what's actually going on in those fields. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Kaur. Uh, I'll start with the field one would be a nice continuation from Shubham. So uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, I take the boundaries that are detected by Shubham and uh, overlay it on one of the high resolution images. And what we see here is uh, we do get the prominent edges, which are maybe fences or hedgerows, but there's still variability going on within those fields. So we want to get to the parcel level information. So within fields, there are different managements that are going on. So we want to get that information too. So what we try to do is use Sentinel-2 to inform us about this management that's going on. So everything that is in the lighter color is the soil pixel and everything that is green is the heavy vegetation. So over time, we see uh, from March, April, May, June, September, the, uh, there are different patterns emerging within those fields. So the definition of a field boundary would be like it's permanent in time. It uh, doesn't matter what month or what date you see, you will always see it on the ground. Whereas the parcels, they are changing. Like if you see this one is quite green on this day, but here there seems to be in two patches. 
over here it becomes three patches. So we want to get this information also included in the model. And how we do that is take all the pixels within the field boundary and plot their time series and see are they clustering into different uh, distinct objects. And for that we use a uh, within uh, cluster sum of squares. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to minimize this metric from each of these clusters. So the lowest one would be the best one, but we try to see where the improvements are not significant and we stop at one of the clusters. So let's say field number 128 is optimizing at two clusters. So we say, okay, this field has now two clusters. So this is just a map of how many clusters we detect in each field. So it ranges from one to five. So we see a lot of variability going on within those fields too. And so this is just an example. So uh, this is a true color image of that day. And we see two patches here. One is for uh, green grass, the other one is for buildings. So I use Shubham's outer boundary uh, outline and just throw these uh, Sentinel-2 images into the model. And what we get out here is two clusters. Uh, and they are distinct clusters because we see here also in the NDVI that the blue one, which is the NDVI for the buildings, is quite low and constant, uh, constant through time, whereas the green patch has a Gaussian shape. So it starts from the minimum, goes to the maximum, and then comes back. So we can detect all such distinct feature within the field too. And if we go to a more managed piece of land like a grassland, so you see on the first day it was quite green, the second day also it was quite green. So if Shubham was using only one of these two dates, he will always get one object. But using this temporal information, we can get actually four clusters. And why, what is quite uh, interesting here is also we are able to detect the hedgerows around the field, which is this green line here, which is quite different if we compare to the time series of other <coughs> clusters. And this is what we found for Joe's farm. So all the black boundaries are what Shubham detected, and all the different colors that I see here are the clusters that I detect within the field. So in this way, we can use uh, machine learning and also time series clustering to define field and parcel boundaries. Another uh, interesting project which we are working on is uh, trying to find out uh, the driveways within a property in uh, urban area. So uh, this is a part of a larger uh, low carbon footprint project which we are running as a case study in Dublin. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, the focus is on electric vehicles. So uh, how ready are neighborhoods to go electric? Uh, so this is the study area. I'll just show you this red uh, polygon uh, test site. And what we have here as inputs is a high resolution 10 centimeter uh, RGB image. Uh, that uh, Dara was talking about. Uh, it was uh, taken from one of these Cessna aircrafts. And uh, we also overlay it with uh, prime two layer uh, uh, information where uh, we have uh, the road layer, uh, we have the property boundaries, we have the building boundaries, and other different information, geospatial information. And what we are trying to deduce from here is uh, what is a potential driveway within the property? So, a potential driveway is flat and not green, and uh, it is in the front of the property rather than on the back side. So we use these sets of rules to find where the driveways are located within the property boundary. And these are the inputs what they look like. So one of the layers is what is green and not green. So this is green and everything else is not green. Another layer is uh, using uh, information from the first layer and trying to find out which areas are flat and not green. So potentially a driveway. So all the non-mast areas, which you can see to our potential driveways. And the third information is it should be in the front yard of the property. So you should only be looking uh, in this direction rather than something which is in the back of the building. Uh, so we use this set of routes uh, to come up with these uh, potential driveways. But another rule is that these boxes should be big enough to hold a car. So we use the geometry information on that and come up with this map here. So everything that you see in green color is a property that can have a potential driveway and everything that is in red doesn't have a driveway in the property. 
and we applied this entire thing on the this big study area in Inchicore, and we find that there are equal number of driveways, uh, property with driveways, and there are equal number without driveways. So, um, yeah, this is all that happened. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, like, I think just um, we're we're coming to the end there, and this is just a taste of some of the bits that we do here. And uh, I guess what we're looking at is, is you know, this kind of theme of um, multiple sensor platform technologies, uh, the role of AI in in, in in taking that data that comes off these multimodal sensor technologies and turn it into information, and underpinning it all are standards interoperability. And you can see there, when I talk about interoperability, it's a fancy word, but it, it, it's like things like poultry, kind of open source. Can we use stuff that's out there to make our lives a lot um, easier? So going back to what I said at the start, I do think that the, the whole kind of like surveying geospatial side is changing, that we are moving into that more kind of, you know, where data is being collected, processed, uh, analyzed, and turned around a lot faster. And that the expectations from customers is that you don't just give them an image map. They want something specific, urban driveways, please. I want it for the entire city. So you're you're talking about something that's like high quality, but at, at scale. And I know some of us might say, well, that's not really my, but we, we all have a part to play in that kind of triangle. Look, let's open it up there. Has anyone got any questions here, like um, about the compliance, about in terms of the operation of drones, any of the sensor te technologies that, you know, whether you think they're good, bad, or indifferent? Um, like in terms of the the um, uh, regulatory stuff, like like you've been looking at this for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and like what like what's your feeling like? Uh, like? Things have changed, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely more kind of like well, there's more stringent rules in the kind of low risk uh, operation of drones, but when you're commercially compliant or in the commercial world, the rules are more stringent, but you have more flexibility to fly. Like previously, you could have never flown in Dublin City without closing the roads. Now we can because we use parachutes and flight termination systems. So there is more cost and there's more kind of complexities around the operations. But the fact that we're now able to do it, we're able to fly in airports, we're able to fly, like you name it, you can fly wherever you need to if you're compliant with the regulation. So it's about really, the rules have gotten stricter, but there are rules and, and it, before there wasn't and you could kind of make up your own really. Whereas now since 2015, the IA brought in the rules, 2021, they implemented the European wide ones, and this year they kind of rolled them out across the country. So, across Europe, there's standardization, harmonization amongst all countries. So, as an operator in Ireland, we can go to Spain or we can go to wherever. So, there's a scalability uh, solution there as well. So, I think rules are really helpful in the regulation. The IEA actually, Ireland are very lucky insofar as they're probably the most, I guess, friendly to operators like this operations here in this country that would never, well not never, but would be difficult to get permission otherwise in other countries. Um, so I do think we are lucky having the Irish Aviation Authority govern what we do. And as long as you're compliant, you can generally operate anywhere. So is there a rule for light aircraft given that you know we saw Cessna appearing there now like like Cessna's go back to your dot. Yeah. So is there still a rule for Cessna like how come uh, drones are well, we're limited like look at it, the battery powers on those are probably 30 minutes, an hour, <coughs> at best. whereas an aircraft, Cessna even, it's a cheap single engine, most, I should say, most survey planes are twin engines, expensive. The one we operate is the single engine, so it's much cheaper to put uh, sensors on those type of aircraft. They fly for much longer, they cover off much larger areas. But in time, these will be more higher performance. That, at the moment, will sort of cover 700 hectares in, a, in an hour, technically, but legally, it's difficult to do that because it's beyond the site when you operate it. So you can't really, so an aircraft assessment will cover a thousand hectares in an hour. So you're almost at the point where these drones technically are able to cover the same as a small aircraft, but legally or with regulations, it's hard to operate that um, because of you can't fly beyond line of sight. But there's certainly a role for aircraft. I think there will always be like, whenever people talk about drones replacing aircraft, but I don't think that'll ever happen. They'll always have the scalability kind of uh, solution where it's going to be technically limited. There will be, um, remote operations where we as operators will no longer be in the field um, with the drone. We could be sitting here at, the, at a computer and a drone is down on the power line in uh, Limerick, for example. You have visual on, from the drone, but the, the command center really is uh, remote from the drone. And that's, that's where the, tech, the industry is going, I think, in the next few years. But 
for now, you're on site, you're operating the drone, it's line of sight. I guess that's why aircraft will, will I think, still in role. Well, that's a typical cost. Supposing somebody was to say, right, you know, uh, I want to, you know, get that uh, set up uh, with photogrammetry and LiDAR and multispectral. Uh, what's, what's the solution? What's, yeah, so what's the cost? I guess you can equip one drone with multiple sensors or you can operate multiple drones, but typical cost probably for a survey of, uh, let's say 50 or 100 hectares, that would, could, you, could be done in a day. So the acquisition cost is probably around 1500 or something like that, depending on the sensors and the kind of the multiple sensors, 1500 to 2000, and then there's the processing. So um, it varies depending on scale, but like most operators would have a person, a drone operator plus a visual uh, spotter. So um, for safety reasons, you need that second person to add cost to it too, but it really depends on the kind of location, I suppose, because often you can send one operator out and it's cheaper, but if you have to send two, it's a bit more expensive. And then if you're collecting lighter, it's a bit more expensive than say 4GB. But often this, people ask for lighter, but they don't need lighter, they might just need um, aerial photography and or the mosaics. So yeah, um, I think, I, yeah, it, it is, cost is coming down, sensors are getting cheaper. As you mentioned, like the box one that was for a drone initially, that was, 300, 400,000, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Now you have, we don't have it here, but the yellow scan was 70, 80,000, something like that, 70, 80,000. The yellow one is out the last couple of months, 15,000. So like cost is constantly coming down and with the decrease in, in the cost of equipment comes decrease in the cost of the service. So um, they are, I wouldn't say they're expensive, but there is applications. Um, where you don't want to close roads, you don't want to close, close railway lines, you don't want to risk human life. These are a brilliant solution. The quality of the data they produce now is, is I won't say it's equivalent to, to survey grade, but if you have the right sensor, it is just as good, um, I think so. Um, yeah, I think the, the okay. future okay. is right. So, does anyone have any observations or comments or anything interesting, or is it just all pretty kind of run of the mill stuff? Just ask yeah. a question just on yeah. Again, like if hypothetically you were in, say, an urban setting, and a client wants you to, to capture some some footage, uh, say the campus here, even, yeah. Um, and as you're recording, capturing images and maybe video, you happen to also capture images of people outside yeah. and car registrations. Have you got a problem there? Exactly. So that's what I was kind of alluding to in the presentation was before you do that operation, you know that you're going to come to the campus here, you're going, you know you're going to collect photography or video. So with that comes the risk of capturing number plates. So we, we what it's called a data a privacy impact assessment. You generally do one of the, or you check if you need to do one. If you don't, then you have a cert certain uh, set of mitigation measures. It might be delete any information uh, that is personally identifiable. If it's a number plate, if it's someone looking up at the footage, if you can recognize that person, that data needs to be deleted before the data is processed or handled. Once you see that you capture that, that has to be deleted, unfortunately. But, that's part of your mitigation, I guess. But yeah, and that's a, that's a, it's like a separate problem to the not problem, but the separate regulation to operating in airspace. It's it's almost a data privacy, but it's data privacy. You well, we had it in um, a deep firm, so we were, yeah. so uh, we were down in um, Dunleary, and uh, this was during the um, uh, the lockdown. And one of the mitigation uh, for the DPIAs was to actually uh, advertise the fact that we were doing carrying out a drone survey. So. We, yes, we were definitely capturing uh, people's heads and whether or not you could identify, you know, Mrs. Smith or Mr. O'Brien, uh, that, you know, the, the jury might be out on that. But uh, part of the mitigation was to actually put up the uh, notification. It's grey. And even when you go on to the um, data commissioner site, you, you'll see that it's grey. It, it, like, it's like, it's like a CCTV, like where does it start? Where does it stop? Um, and I think common sense prevails. And as Fergus said, like if the father Ted kind of answer, like there's multiple kind of you know mitigation um, uh, uh, bits that you should throw in there from removing the imagery right to, to advising people. There's a survey going on, you know. Exactly that. I think as long as you realize that there is a risk there and you kind of addressed it, if it wherever you're dealing with it, it's uh, the university or city council or whoever. As long as you pose the question and say uh, we need to address this issue, and if that's addressed and you kind of talk through it sensibly. Careful when you're collecting the data and you've analyzed the data after to make sure there's nothing there, then 
I think it's just a common sense approach. To yeah, it. and it's just like we all remember Wexford uh, when they went yeah. out we looking at the, the um, uh, mobile homes. It wasn't the fact that they, were, they actually weren't doing anything wrong uh, in, well, again, in inverted commas. What the problem was, they didn't carry a DPIA. So like, like it is a piece of paperwork, but it just shows that you've gone through a kind of an exercise of where you've looked at all the, the uh, potential risks here and you've come up with kind of reasonable uh, you know, um, uh, approaches to kind of like uh, uh, mitigate those, those risks. Yeah. Right. Well, James, will we call it at that then? Hmm? Okay. Right. Well, look, and if anyone has any questions, look, come up, have a chat, and you've got our contacts. Um, we will be following up probably later on this year with uh, looking more on the data handling side. And, and like, uh, like I do think that's. That's something new for Severs. Severs are, are kind of in the pendulum swings on the capture. And I know that they do get involved in some of the processing and analysis, but, but I do think there's opportunities there that could be dug out. So like the next one that we'll, we'll probably go through is take a deeper look at that. I ask, sorry, one last question. Oh, Severs here, are you all using drones? Yeah, okay, let's go see. And uh, can I ask, have you got a flight termination system in your <laughs> area? Because <laughs> it's uh, like, it's, it's so funny. You, you were finding that, um, you know, you go out one, to get one for the M300. And the problem is like, would it, would it be retro compatible with yeah. the kit that you were flying? Like it's not. It's not, it's not just, the, the owner should be on the manufacturer to uh, build it in. To build it in as part of their, like there might be a model where there's an open category um, Drone that doesn't need the parachute, but then there should be the man, the owner should be on the manufacturer, not the operator to retrofit a drone that you're actually at a time that you're putting more, there's a higher risk of the drone falling or failing because you're, you're taking apart the drone and you're modifying it. You've you got so much of these uh, safety kind of features that the thing would just kind of fall out of the sky. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask? Yeah. yeah. If Fergus has taken the data, who's processing the data? Because if I wanted to survey the flat roof across here, do I have to go to another company? To no, we, no, we would do the data collection, the data processing, the data storage, yeah. everything. So, so the, yeah, whatever is the deliverable is, we would generally kind of do it from start to finish and then you get that. Have you tried the GPR in an urban area yet? No, no. we had a. I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you. Yeah. Kind of a fly away. What's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, fly away? What's discussed in this room, guys? <laughs> 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 no, uh, we were doing testing the last day, and uh, we haven't brought anyone over in the kind of greenfield site testing, digging holes, and just making sure because it's our kind of recently started operating it. But the drone just started to hover at three meters, but we couldn't take back and um, bring it back to us. It just sat there at three meters. But we haven't gone in and we wouldn't at the moment because that then needs to be kitted out with um, parachutes and flight termination systems. So I think for the moment that's very much a greenfield site and it's a demo, not a demo, a kind of RD. Like, like to be honest, and the reason for that is the complexity. Again, like as a rat out, there's like other pieces of kit that, that you would normally put on the drone for this particular uh, sensor because it, 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 it wants to that terrain follow and maintain, like, say, exactly two meters above what it considers to be the surface. And uh, there was issues there with the connection between the yeah, radar or that top and the. The um, I guess the question is that related to utilities. Yeah. So surface. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of application. But I would say that's we're a bit away. From. I don't blame that in the country. Yeah, and, 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 and again, I I come back and say like you know we all know here that geophysics is a, another area in its own right. Um, and we're not geophysicists, so what we have done here is actually just ask for two versions, the 500 megahertz and the 150 megahertz, to look at two specific scenarios, not urban. Uh, one of them is peatland, so that's going down, penetrating down to say four or five uh, meters uh, or thereabouts, and the other is agricultural soil. Not looking at soil, uh, say properties, but to look at the stratification underneath the soil, because then that gives us, you know, for instance, like the topsoil layer and so on. It's uh, useful, but. Um, I'd say in a month or two, we might have a bit more information there if you don't have another Absolutely, flyaway. Yeah, I think, um, but I think for now, that'll be a greenfield uh, drone. It's just too much work to get. Now we can take the sensor off it, retrofit it onto another kind of urban suitable drone, but I think for now it's just, yeah, R&D, I would say. And like the same applies to the sniffer, like the gas sniffer like that, definitely has 
potential, but again, you know, it's another piece of kit. You, you've yeah. got to have all the safety kind of features on it and, um, you know, um, try and, and get it working away from people. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the whole thing with drones, especially these guys, is that they're flying, uh, when you're flying, when you're not up, up against a crowd of people or you're in a town or something like that, and get it working, then you come into town, then, you, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we won't talk about that. It's it's remarkable to see how much they've advanced. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's come up on some of our committees. Obviously, we went on with the new iPhone thirteen. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 So, like, I suppose it does. Not initially, it's not causing a threat, but there is. You know, people, some severe scratching their heads saying, "What's the cost?" Like, the art technology has come down. Price even in the last say five ten years, price of a ribbon, <laughs> and now having a lighter scanner on your phone is yes, it's not of great quality, but you can see where the technology is going. So yeah, yeah, there'll be light on every bloody tiny drone soon, but it's um, I think it's a good thing to make them more affordable. Um, but like you know, these things because they're that they've got a robotic base, is that you could look into the future and see you know if it's like utilities, whether it's roads, rail, um, right away, power lines, gas lines, water lines, and so on that you could have this kind of like notion of um, these guys, uh, you know, high, much higher performance than, than uh, what we see here, but that they're used for multiple uh, businesses. And uh, uh, again, Mrs. O'Brien or, or Mr. Smith sits in the office and presses a button and says, right, I want that 400 meters of right of way um, over that uh, section of pipeline uh, covered um, um, and, uh, this, uh, this afternoon to figure out if I need to put a crew out to cut, cut back vegetation, for example. So it, it's that, you know, kind of remote autonomous operation. It's that like a uh, more rapid turnaround of data. And to do that, a couple of things need to be put in place. And, um, and we're not quite there yet, but uh, no. yeah. But you, you can see, it because like, if you look at the, the pattern, um, there was a lot of companies going out and, and even like TII uh, buying their own drones and then training up their own folk. And I'm sure like they probably did it once a year or what, like I, I don't think they're even operational now. So in, like for the um, surveying community, again, look at that as an opportunity that, um, you know, it's kind of almost pointless for a company to have that unless you're doing uh, drone surveys on almost a weekly basis, well, okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but that you you have to, and you'll appreciate this too, that, that it has to be done on a regular basis. It can't be just like three times a year. Yeah. Yeah, most of the larger organizations now, kind of, well, as you've seen over the last year, initially they brought it in-house and tried to do it in-house, but because the technology is just like, so every six months there's these updated pieces of the kit we're looking at here now, they're over two, three years old. The technology has come on so much faster in the last few years. So a lot of the bigger organizations, I've noticed anyway, are now kind of outsourcing to kind of specialist drone companies who do this on a daily basis rather than having in-house teams that do it on an ad hoc basis and the equipment is sitting there and it's not left, it's not, it's not checked. So there is probably, it depends on the size of the organization and how often you use drones, but I'm obviously biased because it's what we do, but it's often the case where those larger organizations just say, right, just outsource it because it's um, easier to manage and it's, the equipment, you don't need to worry about maintaining staff up to date on training and all. Done outside the company, but 